morning, fellowship. Man, what a beautiful weekend God's given us to celebrate and worship him today and sing praises to the only one who truly is worthy of our praise. For you who are relatively new with us this morning, my name is Ben Parkinson, and I'm one of four what we call teaching pastors here at Fellowship who have the privilege of coming alongside Brandon and Mark and Justin uh, and leading and teaching the church as peers in the team-oriented way that we do. And so if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, whether you're here in the worship center or in the chapel, uh, I'll be at the Connection Center uh, after the service and would love to say hi if you have a second to do that. Also welcome those of you joining us online here at home and all across the world. We're so thankful uh, for you worshiping with us wherever you are as well. Uh, And I do want to start off this morning thanking so many of you who have asked us this week, um, man, if there's anything you can do or how you can pray for the hurricane victims in North Carolina. We have such a caring and prayerful church. Uh, I'm thankful that you guys are worried about that and concerned about that. So we do want to tell you what our missions team is doing uh, this morning uh, for that effort and how you can be a part. Uh, First and foremost, I want you to know we're going to give a special gift uh, to one of our Fellowship Associates church plants that ministers there in the North Carolina area uh, to help them minister on the ground to those who are hurting Right now, we told you on Vision Sunday that we've um, planted through Fellowship Associates our partnership with them over 100 churches. And so we have churches all over the country that when things like this happen, we want to first ask the question, man, how can we help someone who is already a part of us who's there? So we're going to give a gift uh, to a a local church there uh, to do that. Secondly, we want you to know we're also going to go ourselves as a church family. We're going to send a disaster relief construction team later on this year uh, as kind of all the debris settles and as all the national groups move out to go in and to help begin to rebuild and uh, to help families specifically with the ways that their lives have been destroyed to give them hope and grace in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But then the third thing that we wanna do, you can see on the screen on the slide there, is we do wanna raise among our church family here over the next couple of weeks, $50,000 to give as just an immediate gift. And our mission team knows the groups to give that to, to get it directly helpful to the people that need help. So I'm thankful for their relationships with those national organizations. Uh, But that's uh, what we're gonna do. And we have a Give Now button on our webpage that's live and active on the very front page. Okay, you don't gotta go to the giving section or anything. If you just go there, it's a banner at the top of our webpage. You can click give now and give right now to this effort, or you can text relief to the number there on the screen, 501-406-2577. It's the same number you can always text your giving to, but if you text that word relief, it'll walk you through the the process of giving to hurricane relief. Uh, I know $50,000 in a couple weeks can seem like a big number. The thing I'm thankful for is that because God's blessed our church across all of our campuses with the kind of attendance that we have and the kind of body that we have, man, if all of us just took a minute today and thoughtfully gave even just a little bit, um, we would be able to do that and more. And so hopefully you'll join with us in that and caring for and loving on those people that are hurting so desperately today. And for those of you who may be joining us for the first time this morning, um, we are preaching through the book of Romans this year as a church family, uh, looking and talking about what it means to live by faith in the world that we're in. And so far in the first few messages of chapter one, when we kicked this series off in Romans one, we started looking at what Paul means in Romans 1, 16 to 17, when he states really the theme of the whole letter to this church some 2000 years ago, when he says that he's not ashamed of the gospel. For in it, it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. He says, for the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it's written, the righteous shall live by faith. That's the theme of the letter, which is why we wanted to preach through this book in a year, talking about what it means for us to live by faith in the son of God. And so Paul here declaring, even though he knows there are people that are going to want him to feel ashamed of talking about what Jesus has done for him on the cross. There are people all over the world, especially in Rome in that day, who are gonna wanna dismiss the gospel. You are gonna make others who believe it feel dumb for believing it, foolish for believing it. Paul says, I I get that, but just know I'm not ashamed to talk about it. I'm not ashamed to explain it. I'm not ashamed to come and share it because I know the beauty of it. 
And I'm not going to let the self-righteousness of others and the arrogance of others deter me, he says, from the joy and the relief that I feel in resting in the overwhelming love of God for me. Because Paul understands that that's what the gospel really does. It lets anyone who receive it and believe in it first and foremost rest in their relationship with God. Understanding that through it we get to step off the treadmill of trying to earn his acceptance somehow through our good deeds in an unhealthy way and just rest in the fact that Jesus Christ has done that work for us. We're unconditionally loved because of what he's done for us. We can just receive it by his grace and rest in his love for us unconditionally. And Paul says, I won't let anyone talk me out of that because of their own self-righteous heart. Paul also understands how it lets anyone who receive it rest not just in the relationship with God, but also in their relationship with others. Not just vertically, he says horizontally. Man, it's just a relief when you finally embrace God's unconditional love for you and realize that because everyone on the planet is in the same boat. Everyone on the planet needs his grace just as much as I do. I don't have to perform for others either in my relationship with them. I can rest in his perfect love for me and know that I'm valuable, that I'm acceptable, that I'm lovable, and then just engage in relationships around me out of that unconditional love. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of that reality. It's the most beautiful thing in the world to me. But as beautiful as the gospel is to free us from having to perform for God or for others in stressful ways, it is a humbling thing to accept, isn't it? It's a humbling thing to trust in. And as human beings, the reality is our pride struggles to admit that and to believe in that. We're constantly tempted to try to prove to God and others why, yeah, I mean, I know I need some forgiveness, but I'm not that bad right? We're all tempted to try and feel that or to explain that away, that we don't really need quite as much forgiveness or grace as maybe everyone else on the earth, or maybe that person over there or this person over here. And, and so before Paul goes into explaining the beauty of the details of the gospel, and we'll get to that in the second half of Romans three and beyond, he's going to explain the details of it and what it means and what Jesus did and why it matters and how it plays into our relationships. Before he does that, He first wants to spend some time here in these first couple of chapters walking us through why all of our man-made solutions to reject it don't work. He wants anyone that begins reading this letter and would dismiss it to keep reading, right? And so he says, listen, before I get to the beauty of it, you've got to know why you need it, no matter what angle you're coming from. And so for the last few weeks, we've looked at people who have gone down the road of the atheist in chapter one who say in their heart, yeah, I hear you telling me that I should submit my life to God's way of living because he loved me so much he sent Jesus to forgive me for for, for kind of breaking his rules, if you will. But I don't want to submit my life to anybody. And so I know how I'll deal with what you're telling me about my need for forgiveness from God. I'll just say there aren't any rules and there is no God and there's no rules to break. So I don't need forgiveness. And so I can do what I want without what you're telling me I need in the gospel of Jesus Christ. If there's no sin, I don't need any forgiveness. So I'll just say it's not real. What we've seen the last couple of weeks in the rest of Romans one is that when we reject God's word and live however we want and give in to our flesh and just do what feels good in the moment over and over and over and over again, that doesn't lead us into abundant life. The scripture shows us it leaves us into a life that descends into all kinds of struggle, all kinds of chaos. When we say we're just animals at the end of the day, we begin to act like animals and treat each other like animals. It's not abundant life. It's not abundant life. Now, Paul knows he says that some people are going to agree with that. They're going to look at what he's saying to the atheists and say, yeah, absolutely. You can't just do whatever you feel like and not ruin your life and other people's lives. They recognize their need for some rules to live by, but they don't want a religion's rules or someone else's rules. They want to use their own rules, make their own rules they can live by. And that's the moralist that we're going to look at today in Romans chapter two, if you want to turn there with me this morning. And then finally, as you're making way there in a couple of weeks after our joint service next week, we'll come back and and we'll we'll keep on moving through Romans. And we're going to look at this third person, this third way people reject their need for Jesus. Even people that would say, yeah, I mean, the atheist, you can't live however you want. And to the moralists, no, there's rules you need to live by, but, but they're not your rules. They're God's rules. 
and, and I know which God is the right God and which rules are the right rules. And because I live by those, I don't need anyone to forgive me because I figured it out. I've got the right way to do it. That's the religious person. That's what we'll look at in a couple of weeks. Now, why am I spending the first chunk of time here in my sermon giving this big picture overview of these first three chapters we're in the middle of right now? Well, I'm doing it because I don't want us to get lost in the forest for the trees as we talk about this section of Romans. I don't want us to look at what Paul's doing here, these first three chapters, if you will, and just say, man, they feel a little repetitive, don't they? God's wrath is revealed. God's judgment is real. You have no excuse. There's no one righteous. It's heavy. It can feel harsh. It can kind of feel like Paul is just beating up on humanity over and over again, saying the same thing. But it's important to walk through this and sit in this part of the book of Romans before we move on to the good news and all the implications of it and what Jesus has done for us. Because the reality is the only way we can truly live in the freedom and joy that living in faith in Christ gives us is if we understand first all the ways we're tempted to reject it. Whether we're rejecting it and never coming to Christ or ways that even those of us who follow Christ are tempted to drift away from the joy of it after we come to faith in him. And we need to hear that as a church family, even as we talk through this, that although the atheist and the moralist and the religious person can be people who are outright rejecting God through those things and rejecting the gospel through those things, also as Christians, when we stop believing that following God's way is best for us, and when we decide we're just tired of it and put it on the shelf and just do what we want to do, that's the heart of the atheist in us rising up, even as followers of Jesus we can lean in to that heart. When as a Christian, we stop believing those things. When we look at someone else's life who's struggling and we puff up our chest a little bit because our lives are going so much better than theirs. And when we attribute that to our faithfulness, our discipline, our obedience, instead of God's grace to us, that's the heart of the moralist cropping up in us. Even though we'd say, yeah, yeah, Jesus needs to forgive my sins to go to heaven, but I'm living my life functionally down here like I'm earning some good things from God and he's blessing me because I'm better than these people. That doesn't lead you to life. We'll look at that today. But we can do that even as followers of Jesus. Or when we look down on others or feel anger or disdain for them because they've rejected God's law and God's word, but we haven't and our pride rises up in the fact that we've chosen the right side and the truth's on our side and we follow the right rules and that's why God hates them and loves us. And that's the heart of the religious person rising up in us even as followers of Jesus Christ. What I'm saying is as we preach these three different flaws in the world's thinking, when it comes to rejecting the gospel, don't tune it out just because you've already trusted in Jesus and say, I'll catch up with you in chapter four. We, we, we lean into this. We're tempted to say these things in our hearts. We, we live this way oftentimes, even as those who have placed our faith in Christ. We all have these things in our hearts. And some of the reason why we struggle to experience the joy and the rest that God has for us, even as those who believe in Jesus Christ. Which is what we see here in Romans 2, 1 through 11, as he shifts gears from the atheist who says there is no God and there are no rules to now speak to the moralist, the one who judges others for not being as good of a person as they are. Look at it with me, Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And Paul continues to write, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he says, therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Looking back at what he just said in chapter one about the atheist, but he says, do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself? that you'll escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume upon the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. For he will render to each one according to his works, to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he'll give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil to the Jew first and also the Greek. 
but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For God shows no partiality. Very words of God. So as Paul talks to the atheists first in chapter one, addressing all the reasons that acting like there is no God and therefore there is no sin to be forgiven by Christ, he says it's not logical nor is it practical. But he knows as he's doing that, there are people listening who would say, absolutely right, Paul. You can't live with no code of conduct and expect your life to go well or to be lovable to others or acceptable to others. You've got to have some kind of anchor, some sense of right and wrong. That's why someone like me would never do drugs. It'll ruin your life. That's why I would never cheat on my spouse. It'll ruin your family and ruin your life. That's why I would never try to scam people in some kind of Ponzi scheme, ruining their life and ours for money. It, it'll, it'll, it'll wreck your world. This person might say, and I don't know if you need God necessarily for any of that. You just need some common sense and a little bit of discipline in your life to realize that, that really what you need to have abundant life on the earth is just to buckle up and be a better person like I am. Paul knows there are people who will agree with him that just living by your raw impulses ruins your life. And that if there's a God out there, he surely will judge those people Not me, because I'm a good person. I do things the right way. I help the poor. I pay my bills. I'm a good parent to my kids. I have an internal standard that makes me better than those other people around me. Which incidentally, they think is why their life is working out so much better for them than other people on the earth. And to that person, God exposes three fundamental flaws in their thinking here in this passage. First, we see him exposed that the moralist assumes that their hypocrisy doesn't matter. Instead of letting their sin actually humble them and bring them to a place of repentance. Look at verse one again. He says, therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, now turning to the moralists, says for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same thing. Paul says here, every human who looks down on someone else because of their particular sin struggle at their core is a hypocrite. I'll say that again. Anyone that looks down on anybody else for their particular sin struggle against God and finds any sense of satisfaction or pride or a sense of thank goodness I'm not like that person, at your core, Paul's saying, you're a hypocrite. And sometimes God shows us this in obvious ways in the world, doesn't he? There's times where God wants everyone to get this point across the planet. So he exposes things that obviously bring us all to say, oh gosh, yeah, I guess that is really true. I mean, I don't know about you. uh, For some of you that are my age, you remember Jimmy Swagger, right? The televangelist who ran and railed over all the other televangelists who were having affairs on their wives and their degradation and their moral compromising and all these kind of things that he said were so terrible only to find out a few months later he was having his own while he was condemning others, right? Or you can put it out of the spiritual world into something more secular. Michael Moore, the Hollywood producer who criticized other producers in his day for taking these kind of unfair, what he called tax breaks, these loopholes that were punishing all these taxpayers and doing this evil thing is kind of part of his self-righteous documentary making. Look at how the world is so bad and look at me exposing how good I am only to find out he was taking the same tax breaks making his documentaries. There's times where God exposes someone publicly and makes the truth extremely obvious to us that we're all hypocrites at heart. But if we're honest, even when it's not national news, even when it's not something that you read on the internet, all of us do this as human beings, don't we? We all have a tendency to minimize our own sins while magnifying others around us. We can all be offended, if you will, at someone else bragging about their life while we minimize the way that we like to slip things into conversation that kind of brags about ours. We, 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 we all can, can, can be frustrated or offended at, at someone who never is happy for anyone else while we minimize our own jealousy and our own envy and our own heart that we also struggle with. I mean, I don't know about you, I've heard people actually gossip about someone else who's a gossip. I mean, we do this all the time. We're incredibly hypocritical even in our own lives, Right? But let me take it a step further, just in case some of us in here are tempted to let ourselves off the hook, because I know some of us would say, well, I mean, 
okay, yeah, there may be things we do hypocritically, like directly, like Paul's talking about here. But just because I may judge someone, let's say their addictive drug habit, who wastes all of their money and all of their time and ruins all their relationships over something that just gives them a, a temporary high, but over time becomes less and less enjoyable, makes them feel worse and worse when they're not doing it. Ben, if, if I look down on them and judge them for doing that because it's wrecking everything around them, how's that hypocritical if I don't do illegal drugs? I'm not doing what they're doing and my life is better because of it. Why, how can you tell me that I'm a hypocrite? And that's true. We don't all struggle with the same things in the exact same way, do we? But to the person that wants to have that conversation with you, you'd have to stop and then ask them, okay, that person wastes all their time and energy and money uh, taking drugs and wrecking their relationships on, on that. What, what do you spend all your time doing? What do you spend all your money on that also brings tension into your relationships and continues to bring you less and less joy so you feel the need to keep ramping it up more and more to try and feel the same joy you did the first time you did it? All of us have those things in our heart that we're tempted to make an idol to give us joy instead of Jesus. And whatever that thing is, we're heading down the same path as anyone else doing anything else that we would be tempted to judge. Is it taking another expensive vacation when you've already taken 12? Is it spending more than you need on whatever hobby you're obsessed with? Is it, is it watching too many reality shows or sports or going to too many concerts of your favorite band? Is it buying too many clothes or being obsessed with too many surgeries or medical procedures? Is it exploding in anger over and over again because that feeds something in you? Is it, is it building up your bank account in ways that are taking advantage of others? No, God's point here is that all of us struggle to let Jesus truly be our all in all. All of us struggle to find hope and joy and satisfaction completely in his love for us and our relationship with him. All of us are tempted to take something good. A lot of those things I just listed aren't even evil, bad things to do. But we're all tempted to take something good, some gift, some blessing that he gives us. And like we said in chapter one, worship the creation instead of the creator. Worship the gift instead of the giver. Find our joy in that thing instead of in him and him alone. All of us are tempted to do that. And so, yes, your temptation may not be an illegal drug like the person you're tempted to look down on and judge to make yourself feel better about yourself, but we all have something and probably more than one something that if we don't submit it to Christ and get a handle on it is every bit as addictive as our own lives as that drug habit is. Sin's addictive, period. And here's the curse of it. Because it's inherently true in all of our lives, the person who judges others for their struggles and for their unhealthy behaviors is constantly under this pressure now to hide the way they're hypocritical about it, to explain away their own issues, to minimize their own issues, right? Every judgmental comment that comes out of our mouths is just putting another brick in the wall of this prison that we're building for ourselves called self-righteousness of having to look better than we are because we based our righteousness on being better than people we judge around us instead of on our faith in Jesus's perfect obedience for us. And yes, that gives us a little bit of a dopamine hit that feels good for a minute while we kind of feel superior to others around us, but it's actually slowly killing us, that pressure to keep looking perfect and being perfect and looking better than others so we can keep judging others. It's killing us. But that's not the only flaw in the moralist system of righteousness, he says. Not only is it that we're all hypocritical at the end of the day, but he also goes on to say the moralist also assumes incorrectly that God's kindness to them is actually affirming their moralistic lifestyle and their self-righteous thinking. Instead of letting the kindness of God do what it's supposed to do in their lives, what the scripture says is lead them to repentance from the ways they're being hypocritical. Look back at verses two through four with me again. He says, we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Talking about the atheists again. But do you suppose, oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself that you'll escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? See, one of the reasons that the moralist is tempted to assume that they're more righteous than others around them is because usually if you're a moralist, your life's going pretty well. 
I don't know about you, I don't know a whole lot of moralistic people that kind of take this attitude of judging others whose lives are train wrecks. It just doesn't tend to happen. If you're looking at your life and it's not going well, you tend not to say, I'll bet they wish they were like me. You just don't do it, right? No, it's the person whose life is turning out the way they want. It's the person who can look at their life and say, it's going pretty good for me, that's tempted to say, therefore I must be doing something right compared to these people that are clearly doing something wrong. They look at the atheist who gives into their gambling and throws all their money away or gives into their drinking and gets a DUI and ends up in prison or gives into their sexuality and develops a crippling STD and they say, well, I'm better than them. I mean, I should be able to talk about how my discipline and my righteous choices are better than theirs. I mean, look at the consequences of their actions. Look at how terrible their lives are. But look at me. I got plenty of money in the bank. I'm not taking pills to stave off my AIDS. I'm I'm, I'm not in prison or have my license taken away, which proves I'm a good person, right? Proves I'm righteous. That either I don't need any God to tell me how to live because I've clearly figured it out for myself, or if there is a God there, he's clearly pleased with me and will accept me just fine to heaven because look at how he's blessing my choices down here on the earth. God says, don't you know that every human being has it in them? to go down any sinful path given the right circumstances. God says, listen, just because you haven't chosen a path that someone else has that's wrecking their life, don't think it's because you don't have it in you to do that. Given the same circumstances, given the same upbringing, given the same whatever it is that their life has taken, you would do the same thing. If you've been led to struggle with other sins than they have that happen to be more socially acceptable or happen to have different consequences on the earth than theirs, that's the grace of God to you. It's not your inherent goodness. And if you've been able to avoid certain things along the way because others have come along and kind of helped you when you didn't even realize it, that's God's grace to you. It's not because you're better than the person who hasn't had that grace given to them. God says, your rejection of my love and my kindness is just as hurtful and just as in need of forgiveness as theirs. And so you're meant to look at the sin struggles of others, he says, whose lives are falling apart and not say, look at how much better I am than them. God says, you're meant to look at them and my patience towards you and my grace towards you and my love towards you and say, God, show me the same tendencies in me to make an idol out of the things I struggle with as I see in them. Give me the strength, God, to enjoy you more in my life than the thing that I'm tempted to struggle with. Because when I look at others, God, and and I see their lives falling apart, it doesn't make me puff up my chest in pride. I realize I'm just a breath away from turning the sin that I tend to be addicted to into something that's going to wreck my life as well and ruin my life as well. So God, thank you for your grace to spare me the temptations of some. Thank you for your grace to bless me in ways I don't deserve. Thank you for your grace to protect me from myself so I don't end up walking away from you. And forgive me for the ways that I do the same things that others do, even if it's in a different way than them. God says, my kindness to you in blessing your life is meant to lead you to be thankful and repentant. It's meant to make you examine your own life and deal with your own issues in an honest and humble way. But the moralist takes the failings of others and takes the grace of God in their life. And instead of attributing that to God's grace and patience, they attribute it to their own goodness. They decide that's the difference between them and the person they're looking down on. Their own good choices, their own internal compass, and they give themselves credit for the kindness of God in their life, he says. And again, that feels good for a minute, doesn't it? Until your obsession or your addiction or your idol starts to produce some of those negative consequences in your life that you judge others for. Because now by your own moralistic philosophy of life, anything that goes wrong in your life is gonna be proof to others around you that you're not really as good as you looked on the outside. And all of your friends that you used to love to sit around with and judge others are gonna turn right around and judge you now, aren't they? Many of us have experienced that, right? That we're in relationships with people and they're a little moralistic and we kind of sit around and talk about others and kind of judge others and judge what's going on in their life and gossip about them. And then as soon as something goes bad in our life, the first thing we feel is insecurity and fear. We're terrified because we know if they, we did it to someone else, they're gonna do it to me. And you feel the weight of that and you feel the pressure of that. 
There's no room to be broken. There's no place to acknowledge our weakness and frailty or to be authentic. There's no basis for others to give you grace and come alongside you when you're down and out because you've based your whole world on this idea that good people get what they deserve in this life and bad people get what they deserve in this life. And so you live under that pressure that things have to keep going good for you in your life or else you have to admit you're not as good as you tried to make yourself out to be. It's terrifying, it's exhausting, and it ultimately will let you down, he says. But that's because the moralist tries to live in this self-righteous club with all of their self-righteous friends who condemn the failures of others around them, but give each other a pass on their own stuff in a hypocritical way which is why Paul has to finally remind them in the third section of this little part he's talking about, that even though they may constantly tip the scales to explain away their own hypocrisy, to explain away their own unrighteousness, to explain away their own issues, God doesn't. God doesn't. God's an impartial judge, he's gonna say. And if you wanna live by the scales, okay, Paul says you can live by the scales, but just know he doesn't fudge the way you do on those scales. It says in verses six through 11, again, he will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey in righteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil. The Jew first and also to the Greek but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good to the Jew first and also to the Greek for God shows no partiality. Now as Christians, when we come across this kind of part of Paul's passage right here, it rubs us a little wrong, doesn't it? Um, We spend our whole time and kind of lives in here together talking about how no one can earn the right to go to heaven. No one can earn the right to live with God forever, that Jesus had to earn it for us, right? And so we come across a passage where Paul's saying, hey, if you do the right thing, you'll have eternal life. If you do the wrong thing, God will curse you. And we're like, no, the Bible's all about grace and forgiveness and patience and long suffering. It's, It's not about us trying to earn our way to heaven, but that's Paul's point. Remember who Paul's talking to. He's talking to the moralist that thinks they can earn their way into the good graces of a God if there is one or who thinks they can justify their own life by their good deeds. His point is, listen, if you wanna go down that road, yeah. If you can be perfect, you can earn eternal life with God. The problem is he knows no one can. We'll get to that in chapter three. There's none righteous, no, not one, none who understands, none who seeks for God. But he says, yeah, I mean, if if you want to go down that path, more or less, that's fine, but you better be perfect in it. Because his point eventually is going to be, and by the way, there's only one who ever has been, which is why faith in him and his righteousness for you is the beauty of this gospel that I'm not ashamed of, right? And not just in his morality to avoid the things that God says will ruin our lives, but also in the perfect way that he loved and sacrificed for others around him. He says, Jesus can trade his righteousness for your sinfulness because he didn't have any sinfulness to die for himself. But he's the only one if you wanna live by that kind of law in your life. The problem with the moralists is that they actually assume they can do this, that their hypocritical shaded version of being good and doing good is enough to earn glory and to earn honor and to earn peace with God instead of letting Jesus give it to them and placing their faith in his righteousness for them to grant them those things in this life and in the next. So it's tempting to want to take credit for our own righteousness. It's tempting to want to have a little something to brag about when it comes to the good choices that we feel like we're making over those who we see struggling. There's a part of us deep down, all of us that wants that to be a little bit true, that wants to add a little something, even if we're Christians, to what Jesus did that gives us the edge on other people, that makes us feel safe, that gives us some control, because if it's about me earning it, then at least I have some control over that instead of having to pin on God's grace to me, no matter what's going on in my life. We want to pat ourselves on the back a little bit, but here's why God wants to rescue you from that kind of thinking. As good as it can feel in one moment, it's a lot it's setting up to crush you in the next. It traps us in this works-based world with God and others that ends up pushing us to hide our sin, to redefine our hypocrisy, to live in constant fear, that we're gonna break our own rules that even we've set up for ourselves, the rules that we've judged others by, that are gonna make other moralists turn around and judge us. It's a pride that ruins 
our lives. Which is why Paul, another letter to the Ephesian church, will say boldly in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. He says, if you're boasting, that's a problem. Why? He doesn't say it to shame people who are boasting. He says it to free us from the pressure of trying to live a life we can't live and bragging about it only to fall at some point and have everyone judge us for our own words. He says, don't do that to yourself. Don't put yourself under that kind of weight. You can't live up to it. It's why Luke records this parable of Jesus, right? In case you think it's just Paul saying this, inspired by the Holy Spirit. No, no, he, he gets it from Jesus. And, and, and look when Luke writes this parable, he makes sure we know who Jesus is talking to in Luke 18, nine through 14. It says, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and who treated others with contempt for not being as righteous as they were, right? It's the moralist. It's the same person. Jesus says, two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men looking down on extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. So he's thanking God. He's thanking God that he's better than everybody else. Look at what the tax collector says. Standing far off, wouldn't even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. The righteous shall live by faith. So I wanna wrap up speaking to two different people and concluding what we're talking about today. First, I wanna to speak to the moralist who is in here. Whether you're a moralist who's rejecting God outright completely and saying, I don't really need God's rules, I have my own, or whether or not you're someone who's following Jesus, but you have this temptation, this heart in you on a regular basis. It's that the moralist who judges others God's saying he's begging you to lay down the weight and the misery of your moralism and rest in his grace for you. It's miserable trying to earn God's acceptance every day. It's miserable trying to earn other people's acceptance every day. It's exhausting trying to redefine your sin in hypocritical ways so you can justify your own failings. And it's exhausting trying to hide your sins that you know you can't redefine. God's begging us to rest in the good news of the gospel. Admit that God's standard is better than yours and that no one could live up to it, including you. See your sins as equally offensive to God as anyone else's so you can engage with others in your horizontal relationship as a fellow struggler and not a judge looking down on them. Let the grace of God in your life move you to worship instead of boast. The grace of God in your life should move you to praise him for all the grace he's poured out on you instead of thinking in our hearts, thank God I'm a little better than these other people over here. Let it move you to repent in the ways you don't deserve instead of letting it move you to judge and rest in the joy that God loves you just as you are, which is why he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for you in the first place because he already loved you before you ever did anything good for him or good in and of yourself. Let the gospel wash over you to free you from the prison of your self-righteousness. This prison that you're building for yourself that feels good in the short term, but will suffocate you in the end. That's the first person that I hope walks away encouraged today in a strange way. The second person I wanna to speak to though is to the person who's felt judged in here by the moralist. The person who, who, who's felt judged in here by some of the moralistic attitude, even from some of us in the church. You should come to this passage and see what Paul's saying to the moralist and actually feel a sense of encouragement that God doesn't think that anyone on the earth is better from you even if they tried to act like he does. I'll say that again. If you've ever felt from someone that God's worse, more mad at you, more angry at you, more disappointed in you than he is in them, that's not God. That's not God's heart for you. That's them dealing with their own self-righteousness and their own issues. You're equally loved, you're equally accepted, and you're equally valuable in Christ as anyone on the earth. And you need to hold your head up high around here as you walk around our church family. 
See, that's one of the things that we miss at times about this section of Romans if we're not careful. We tend to only read it through the eyes of the self-righteous person that, that God's condemning or he's correcting or he's kind of pointing out their flaws. And the way that God's telling each group that they need grace, they need Jesus, they need the beauty of the gospel to be free. And that's true, he is doing that. But don't forget, these heavy passages about wrath and judgment are also meant to give hope to the person who already knows they're under judgment who already knows that they're under the wrath of God in their life from their poor choices. And they see how the consequences of their actions are playing out in their life and it's wrecking their life and it's ruining their life. To that person, these things are meant to give hope because in the end, what he's gonna show is because there's none righteous, no, not one, because there's none who understands, none who seeks for God, because all of us are in the same boat together, fellow strugglers who need God's grace. Guess what? That means you're just as lovable as anyone else on the planet. You're just as acceptable as anyone else on the planet. You're just as usable as anyone else on the planet. You're just as valuable as anyone else on the planet to God. If it's all by his grace and for his glory, if that's what all this is about, then you don't need to feel insecure at all, no matter who you are or what you've done. You are whole in Christ. You can be just as righteous as anyone else by faith. By faith. Because no matter how you try to avoid it in the end, the righteous shall only live by faith. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you for your goodness to us. God, I thank you that even as you dismantle and take apart and say these hard things to others who reject you or even to us who believe in you but are tempted to fall into the same traps, God, it's because you love us. It's because you're trying to free us It's because you want us to walk in the joy of your unconditional love for us so that we can walk and join our relationships with others. God, I beg you that Fellowship Bible Church would be the kind of church that as we go out into the world around us, into the community of Central Arkansas around us, that it would be this tribe of people going out with this amazing confidence in your love this amazing confidence in your acceptance of us, this amazing confidence in your forgiveness of us, but also this amazing humility that we're not confident because we're better than those we're walking around. We're confident because your grace is more amazing than anything we can possibly fathom and you're offering it to anyone who will listen to it that we're around. We're confident because we're the same as everyone around us, needing your grace just as much, not because we're better than. God, help us to show the world the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ, not just in what we say with our mouth, but how we live it out around them every day, how we accept them, love them, welcome them into our lives, treat them. God, I beg you for that in your name. Amen. Thanks again for listening to the word of God. We are blessed to reach you throughout the week through whatever platform you're listening on. If you're needing prayer or you want to talk to someone about your walk with Jesus, reach out to us at fellowshipar.com slash contact. Have a great week.